So that, to me, is the first line that we might keep before us when we think about the Holy Eucharist. It is a gift. And then, secondly, let us reflect on the words spoken by the deacon or the priest just before the people come up for communion. And in the full form as used in the Greek tradition, which I think you also follow here, we say, with fear of God, with faith and love, draw near. So here are contrasting feelings that we are to have as we approach. Fear, not in the sense of blind terror, but of awe. Holy Communion is fire that burns the unworthy. And I know that I am unworthy. But, along with fear, we are to feel faith and love. Faith not in myself, but in Christ's steadfast love. So that's the spirit in which we draw near. In the words of St. Ambrosi, the Starets of Optima, we come to communion between hope and fear. In the prayers of preparation before communion, we say rejoicing and trembling at the same time. So we come to communion not because we deserve the holy gifts, but because we need them. And we come not because we are worthy, but because Christ himself invites us, because he says, draw near. Now, if that is the spirit in which we are to approach for communion, then how often should we come? Here, let me quote an answer given by a 7th century author, St. Anastasius of Sinia. When, when asked how often can we come for communion, he says, there are some people who may come for communion every day. Others, he says, may come once a week. Others once a month, others once a year, others should never come at all. Now, the point which St. Anastasius is making is that you can't have a single rule that is applicable to everyone. It all depends on the inner state and the way of life of each person. So, in order to understand how often we should come for communion, we need to be guided by our spiritual father or our parish priest. Perhaps they'll be the same person. I would certainly say we should come frequently. Not because we are worthy, but because we are saints. Not because we are saints, but because we are sinners. In the lives of the saints, we sometimes read of hermits who didn't receive communion for many years. Vladimir Lossky says, yes, but for them, the act of communion was so deep and so total that to receive once in five years was enough. But it's probably not enough for us. We are sinners and we need the help that the Holy Eucharist can give. What does frequently mean? I think in the Orthodox Church today, daily communion is very rare, though it was certainly frequent among the early Christians. I would certainly say go every week 
if your spiritual father blesses you to do so. But there's also great value in non-communicating attendance at the divine liturgy. What is vitally important is that Holy Communion should never become something automatic, casual, taken for granted. I remember someone saying to me in Orthodox in England, well, because I'm going to the Divine Liturgy this Sunday, I may as well have communion. What would be the point of going to the liturgy if I didn't have communion? That attitude seems to be very dangerous. Holy Communion should never be something we take for granted. It should always be an event, a happening. Something to which we specially look forward with a sense of eager expectation. Something to which we specially look back with grateful joy. Something that stands out in our memory. Let me end. Tonight, with some words again from St. Nicholas Cavasila, exactly about the Holy Communion. This is the final mystery, and beyond this it is not possible to go. And perhaps I might take also some words of St. John of Kronstadt that I used the other night. The Eucharist, he says, is a continual miracle. In the words, take, eat, drink, there is contained the abyss of God's love for humankind. O oh, perfect love, O oh, all-embracing love, O oh, irresistible love, what shall we give to God in gratitude for this love? Thank you. Do we have a little time for questions, or would you like to end now? Time. Well, if there are any questions or comments. Yes. The prayers right before we go up for the gifts. Um, something about our promising not to tell of the mysteries to the enemies of God. Mm -hmm. And... I'm wondering if you could tell us about that. I I really have, I don't know if I know any enemies. And uh, I, I don't know quite what to do about that. Yes, the question is, uh, with reference to the prayer said immediately before communion, at thy mystical suffer, son of God, today receive me as a communicant, for I will not speak of the mystery or the secret to thine enemies. Um, who do we mean here by the enemies? Um, now, I take that to be a reference that we will not speak of the mystery to the enemies of Christ, not my personal enemies but the enemies of Christ. And what does it mean not uh, speaking of the mystery or the secret to Christ's enemies? And of course that's borne out by what follows. I will not betray thee with a kiss like Judah. Um, what I think this means is that we are to hold the Holy Eucharist, the communion in very profound reverence and living as we do in a largely secular and unbelieving world, we are not to lose our sense of wonder and awe before the Holy Eucharist. Betraying the secret to the enemies of Christ would mean that we lost our sense of the holiness of communion. And in that sense, we're betraying Christ to 
his enemies who are the unbelievers. That's the way I think. But I wonder if anyone else would like to say how they understand it. It is an urging us that we should treat the Holy Communion with reverence and not cheapen it, not lose sight of its holiness. Does that make sense? But how would others have a different explanation? Yeah. Not falling back into sin ourselves. Not falling back into sin ourselves. Yes, that that's uh, um, uh, also, I think, a helpful line of thought. Yes, that we would, that we should not fall back into sin ourselves. That if we receive communion and then we go out and live as if we had not received it, we would exactly be betraying Christ's secret to his enemies. We would be giving him a kiss like Judah because our faith would not have been fulfilled in our actions and lived out, uh, and that would be a sense of betrayal. I think that is another possible way of taking it. Well, it fits with the first way. Yes? Many of the words of the liturgy come directly from Scripture. Are these words from Scripture? I will not betray thee with a kiss like Judas. No, I will not speak of thy secret or mystery to the enemies. I don't think that is from Scripture. No, I can't recall any passage like that. Um, though, of course, you're absolutely right that the text of the liturgy is full of scriptural phrases. But at that point, I think this there isn't an exact parallel. Um, yes, yeah, the two... Uh, your state on the term baptism of the spirit, particularly to those who speak of the charismata or the charismatic movement, which is also within Orthodox? Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, how should we understand a baptism in the spirit or baptism with fire in the spirit? Um, There is quite a rich patristic teaching on this. Um, a book I would recommend by a Roman Catholic writer, the author is Father Kilian MacDonald. I can't for the moment remember the title of the book. It's a book published by the liturgical press at Collegeville, um, St. John's Abbey. Does anyone know that book? Ah, well. Um, there, there is a lot of discussion of the patristic evidence. Um, certainly, a number of the fathers do use the phrase baptism with fire, or baptism with fire and the spirit. And they see this as a further stage and beyond water baptism. And they sometimes contrast it with water baptism. Um, and of course, these passages have been taken up and much discussed by members of the charismatic movement who are working in the field of patristics. Um, on my reading of the fathers on the subject of baptism with fire and the spirit, they did not consider this to be a new grace. They saw it simply as the fulfillment and living out of the original grace of baptism. So, baptism with fire and the spirit is not to be seen as superseding water baptism, and indeed is not to be contrasted with it, but it is simply living out the fullness of the grace of baptism 
received sacramentally. It is not to be seen as something non-sacramental, but it is the fulfillment of the sacrament in our lives. Therefore, I think it corresponds to what St. Mark the Monk means when he says, that we should become consciously aware of the grace of baptism that we have received. This conscious awareness would be what other writers, I don't think Mark uses this phrase, speak of as baptism with fire and the spirit. The chief authors to look at among the fathers on this subject are Mark the monk, whom I've already mentioned, Then the homilies of Macarius, and they, those are texts from the late 4th or early 5th century. Uh, Mark has not been fully translated into English as yet. The homilies of Macarius, the main collection, is available in English. It has been translated more than once. And then the third author of particular importance on this whole theme is Simeon the New Theologian, who is 11th century, and a good bit of him has been translated. Mark is available in a full translation in French, uh, and so is Simeon in a full translation in French. Now, none of those three authors attaches special importance to speaking with tongues. There are brief references to that in Macarius, though they're rather ambiguous. There are some passages in Simeon which may allude to speaking with tongues, but it's not altogether clear. But it's in evident that the fathers did not consider that speaking with tongues was a decisive criterion for baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I think that they envisage, when they speak of conscious awareness, something far deeper and more inward. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And that's perhaps the way the gifts of the Spirit are shown within us in a total transformation of our inner life. And I don't think that um, either these three or other fathers who talk about baptism with the Holy Spirit saw it as a single event. They saw it, I think, simply as a continuing and ever-growing fulfillment of the total Christian life. So they weren't, as far as I can judge, thinking primarily of a single conversion experience. So the view, I think, of the fathers would certainly be we become Christians through baptism in water, and if we go deeper in our Christian life, what we shall discover is the full meaning of our sacramental baptism. But this discovery of the fuller meaning is simply the living out of what we were given originally through the sacrament. And they would not have wished to single out any particular external phenomenon, such as speaking with tongues, as being a decisive test. They are much more interested in the total and gradual transformation of our life as we follow the Christian way. Does that meet some of your points? Yes. Mm. Yes, please. Earlier you had uh, quoted a statement saying uh, the goal of this life is to have an active awareness of the Holy Spirit in our life. Yes. And I remember reading something uh, similar saying uh, the acquisition of the Holy Spirit is the purpose of the Christian life. There seems to be a little bit of contradiction there in that if we receive 
the Holy Spirit at chrismation, that it would be there. And your statement of, of having more of an act of awareness seems more appropriate. Is there just is the acquisition just maybe not an accurate terminology, or am I missing something? The phrase about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit comes if I remember rightly, from St. Seraphim of Sarov, from his conversation with Nicholas Motovilov, where St. Seraphim, in a famous statement, defines the aim of the Christian life as being the acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. But I don't think he meant that we do not at this moment have the Holy Spirit at all. I think by acquisition he meant the fuller awareness of the Spirit of God. Um, St. Seraphim would certainly have accepted the teaching of the Church that we receive the Holy Spirit through baptism and chrismation, which under normal circumstances form a single mystery. And so he would not have denied that we are given the Holy Spirit at our baptism and chrismation. So when he speaks of acquisition, I think he means the fuller awareness of that which we have received, um, though that is not the literal sense of his phrase. I would take that to be the meaning. Um, we might recall the words of the prayer, Heavenly King. Heavenly King, paraclete, spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things. And then we say to the Spirit, come and abide in us. Now, does that mean that at this moment the Spirit is not within us? I don't think that is a correct way of understanding that prayer. We say, come to the Holy Spirit, but he is already within our heart through baptism, through chrismation. So in saying come, we are asking for a fuller awareness and realization of this gift that is already within us. I don't think any of us would wish to understand that prayer as meaning that we were without the Spirit totally, even though we are baptized and chrismated. Surely that cannot be the meaning. And we have already said that he's everywhere present and filling all things. So there's a certain paradox in then saying come, as if he wasn't already there. So I think we are saying come, meaning come in a greater fullness with greater power. Yes? But then he is also, when you say that he is also there even before baptism, he isn't doing, he isn't coming in the sense of someone walking through a door at baptism if he is in all places and fills all things. Then why, I guess I'm just not, not understanding. Well, uh, it is, it is not an easy thing to understand because there are many different levels of the Spirit's presence. But the Spirit is everywhere present in the world from the moment of first creation. In the Genesis story, uh, the Spirit is involved in the creation. The Spirit broods over the waters of chaos, Genesis 1-2. So the Spirit is involved in creation and the Spirit is therefore present from the first creation of the world. The Spirit in the Creed is said to speak through the prophets, so clearly the Spirit is active in the people of the Old Testament. But the Spirit is given with a new fullness on the day of Pentecost. So there are different levels of the Spirit's presence. And we do not speak, usually, of the Spirit dwelling within us in a personal way until we have been baptized though the Spirit is also present everywhere, he can be present in a greater degree within us because of that. But how can something be more full? By definition, if it's full, it's, it's full. It, it, it's done, it's popped off. You can't. I don't understand how something can be more full, continue to be more full, and it's already full to begin with. Well, we may not understand it, but that is the situation. Um, 
that uh, the Spirit is everywhere present and fills all things, and yet the presence of the Spirit is more clearly manifest within certain people rather than others. We speak of the saints as spirit bearers, so that, yes, uh, the Spirit is everywhere present, but his fullness is manifested in various ways and to different degrees. Yes? Christ was in all the towns, but he traveled all the same. He did not know differently in each town, but he did not have a miracle in every place. In some places, but he could not. Yes, the comment there was that Christ visited all the different cities but he only performed miracles in some of them. And I think behind that lies the principle that we can do nothing without divine grace, but God also asks of us the cooperation of our freedom. We have free will, we can close our hearts against God's grace, we can refuse to cooperate with him, and in that sense we can shut the spirit out. Or we can open our hearts to God's grace, and we can let the spirit work within us. But God does not use force and violence we cannot be saved without him, but he will not save us against our will. He waits for our free cooperation. And this is why the action of Christ, as you say, the action of the Holy Spirit, is more apparent in some persons than it is in others. As it says in the letter to Diognetus, a text of the first or second century, God persuades he does not compel, for violence is foreign to him. It says in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open, I will come in. Christ knocks on the door. He doesn't break it down. He waits for us to open. Thank you.